welcome back. So last time we saw the uh, general classification of topological insulators and superconductors in terms of the periodic table. This time we're going to flesh out a little bit the entries of this table. In particular, we're going to focus on a, uh, a one diagonal of this table. We're going to choose this diagonal over here. Uh, so we're going to uh, start from class A1 in zero spatial dimensions that's classified by an integer z. We're going to see what the physical uh, significance of this uh, z invariant is. And then we're going to just march down the diagonal one by one uh, and, uh, and see what the uh, corresponding classification of each, each symmetry class is and what its physical meaning is. So let's start right over here. We're in zero sp spatial dimensions, class A1. So what is class A1? This is a class that has time reversal symmetry that squares to plus one and no particle hole symmetry and therefore also no chiral or sublattice symmetry. And we're in zero spatial dimensions, so we're dealing with a, basically a quantum dot or a finite system a, a, a of electrons with quantized levels. And uh, a, a, let's uh, consider the Hamiltonian of such a system. So this, a, 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 this uh, Hamiltonian is an n, n by n dimensional matrix. Suppose our system has n states or n orbitals in it. And it has time reversal symmetry. Since time reversal squares to plus one, there always is some basis in which we can represent time reversal simply by complex conjugation. So the, the time reversal operator is simply complex, con uh, complex conjugation, which means that uh, our Hamiltonian matrix in that basis is simply a real matrix. Now, uh, what does a spectrum of such a system look like? It's just a set of discrete levels. So here's the energy spectrum. And here are uh, our n levels. And uh, a, a, our, our system has to be gapped, meaning that uh, our Fermi level for our electrons passes over here. So all the states below the Fermi level are, are filled, and the ones above the Fermi level are empty. OK, and uh, we're going to classify gapped systems, meaning that there's no level that crosses exactly the Fermi level. OK, so uh, the claim is, according to our periodic table, is that this a, a symmetry class in zero spatial dimensions should be classified by integer value invariant z. And now we see what this uh, integer in, in invariant means. We can simply count how many levels are filled, or how many levels are below the Fermi, le uh, Fermi energy. And that would uh, correspond to an integer nu. OK, and uh, by definition, this integer cannot change as long as our system is gapped, meaning uh, as long as no level crosses 0, which is the Fermi level. So uh, it's simply the number of negative energy states that are, th that's our integer invariant z. There's one more general property of, this, uh, of the classification that I'd like to demonstrate through this example. So uh, the classification always has a group structure. OK, so z, the integer numbers, come with the group operations, we can add to different integers. What does this integer mean? So uh, um, uh, in fact, we can, what does uh, uh, adding different integers mean? So we can always combine or stack different uh, systems together. Each system has some number of uh, filled energy levels. And if we consider one system, which is just a combination or stacking of the two zero dimensional systems, we get a new system in the same symmetry class, the same spatial dimension. So uh, we can always define the group operation uh, or uh, how to add different phases. So if we combine two different uh, uh, systems by stacking, this one has a, uh, a integer invariant nu1 and this one has nu2. If we stack these two systems together, we'll get a new system in the same symmetry class that's characterized by an invariant, which is simply the sum of the two invariants. In the case of a classification by an integer z, this is just adding integer numbers. If it's z2, we add the integer a, a, a invariants mod 2. OK, so that, that was uh, our first entry in the table, the, the corner of this, uh, of, of the, uh, of this diagonal. And now we'll just uh, shift one over. So we're, we're now in class BD1 in one spatial dimension. And that should also be classified by an integer invariant z. OK, so what is class BD1? 
Now we're uh, considering a system that has time reversal symmetry that squares to plus one, particle hole symmetry char or charge conjugation that also squares to plus one, and therefore this uh, system also has the combined symmetry, which is the sublattice or chiral symmetry, which is the combination of time reversal and particle hole, and that's a unitary symmetry. So that's present, meaning s equals one. So uh, we can think about our system as a one-dimensional system, a one-dimensional chain. And uh, uh, let's uh, uh, imagine that every site in this chain has n electronic states, or n orbitals. OK, and uh, it's a superconductor, so it's characterized by um, a mean field Bogolub of the Gen Hamiltonian. Let's imagine that our system is translationally invariant along this chain, so we can write the Hamiltonian in momentum space. OK, so this is our Hamiltonian. H of k, psi of k is the Nambu spinner that we saw last time. So uh, uh, this is a 2n dimensional spinner. And uh, it's written over here. It's the combination of uh, uh, the uh, 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 creation operators psi 1 uh, uh, dagger to psi n dagger and their Hermitian conjugates psi 1 to psi n at every momentum point k. OK, so uh, uh, this is our Hamiltonian. It's a 2n by 2n dimensional matrix. And we can write it in block form in this, in this, uh, in this way. So little h of k is an n by n dimensional Hamiltonian, which is the normal part of the Hamiltonian. And uh, delta of k is also an n, a, a, a n by n dimensional matrix, which is the uh, anomalous part of the pairing potential that characterizes this superconductor. OK, and as we saw, delta of k has to be an anti-symmetric matrix. And uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the upper left and lower right blocks have to be related in this, in this way. So what are the symmetries that this Hamiltonian has to satisfy? So uh, uh, in class BD1, it should have particle hole symmetry. OK, so uh, in this uh, example, particle hole is represented by the product of tau x, tau is the Pauli matrix that acts on the particle hole or Nambu space. Particle hole is represented in this way. So um, the conjugation of the Hamiltonian h, k, h of k by the particle hole, hole operator should give us minus, a h, a, 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 minus h at minus k. Time reversal is uh, represented simply as complex conjugation in our, in our basis. So a, a conjugating the Hamiltonian h of k by time reversal gives us h of minus k. And finally, since we have both particle hole and time reversal, we also have their product, which is the sublattice or chiral symmetry. So that's simply the Pauli matrix tau x. And that has to anti-commute with the Hamiltonian, meaning that conjugating the Hamiltonian by tau x at k simply should give us minus h at, at the same momentum k. OK, so uh, let's write the Hamiltonian slightly more compactly. We can write it in this uh, form. So h of k is our n by n matrix, tensor product with tau z. And there's another n by n matrix delta of k, which is tensored into tau y. And because of the chiral symmetry, which is simply a S, which is tau x, we are required that uh, our Hamiltonian anti-commutes with tau x. So this is actually all we can write. We're not allowed to write another matrix that's tensored into tau x and another matrix that's tensored into the unit 2 by 2 matrix 1. So uh, this is actually the most general form of the Hamiltonian that would obey the chiral symmetry. And we can derive more conditions on these matrices h of k and delta of k from time reversal and from particle hole. So uh, just from uh, the uh, requirement that the Hamiltonian is time reversal symmetric, we know that time reversal in our basis is uh, represented as complex conjugation. So h star of k should be equal to h uh, of minus k. And we, if we apply this to the uh, uh, Hamiltonian written in this form, we just apply it to each uh, element. And you can easily check that this implies that uh, the normal part of the Hamiltonian uh, is a lowercase h of k 
has to be a, a invariant a, under this uh, transformation. So h star of k should be equal to h of minus k. And in the same fashion, the uh, a pairing potential delta of k should uh, obey that its uh, complex conjugate is equal to minus delta at minus k. Okay, the extra minus is coming from the fact that tau y is in a, a, is an imaginary matrix. Okay, so uh, a, with this we've checked a, a, a sublattice symmetry and we've checked time reversal symmetry, and particle hole would follow automatically because of the fact that a particle hole can simply be expressed as the uh, chiral symmetry times time reversal symmetry. Okay, so uh, a, this is the most general Hamiltonian a, a, in one dimension that we can write in class BD1. So a, to bring our Hamiltonian into a more convenient form, we perform a unitary tra a transformation, which is simply a 90 degree or pi over two rotation around the y direction in the tau space. So um, uh, this is what this uh, transformation does. It simply takes tau z into tau x, tau x into minus tau z, and tau y into tau y. So after this uh, transformation, this is our new Hamiltonian. It's simply a linear combination of uh, hk tensor into tau x plus delta of k tensor into tau y. And uh, we can write our Hamiltonian in an off-diagonal block form in this uh, way. Okay, so uh, in, in Nambu space, it's just a, a purely off-diagonal matrix. There's some uh, a matrix on the off-diagonal, which is n by n, capital Q. And uh, a, a capital Q is just uh, this n by n matrix. It's just h of k minus i delta of k. And of course, the Hamiltonian has to be a Hermitian matrix. So on the other corner, there's Q dagger. OK, so now uh, we're going to um, um, uh, we're going to massage this Hamiltonian slightly further. OK, so we have a one dimensional gap system. So uh, uh, overall, there are two n bands. There's particle hole symmetry. So these bands are e, e to minus e symmetric. And uh, there's a gap at 0, which is the Fermi level. OK, so uh, what we care about is basically the classification of these types of Hamiltonians. And uh, two Hamiltonians would be equivalent to each other as long as we can deform one of them into another without closing the energy gap at zero energy. And without breaking any of the protecting symmetries of class BD1. OK, so basically we don't care about how the spectrum looks exactly. All we care about really is uh, the wave functions of the field or negative energy states. So we can deform the spectrum in an arbitrary way as long as we don't close the gap and we stay in, in the same topological phase. So it's convenient to, call, to uh, perform what's called flattening of the bands or flattening of the spectrum. We can simply uh, flatten both of these bands into uh, completely flat or dispersionless bands. It's some arbitrary energy minus epsilon naught and similarly flatten the positive energy bands into uh, a, a completely flat bands at a positive epsilon naught, okay, without closing, without ever closing the gap in between. Okay, so after this uh, flattening operation, we get a new Hamiltonian H tilde, which is equal to epsilon naught times a new n by n matrix uh, lowercase q uh, of k. Okay, and uh, uh, now we can easily check that uh, since these, uh, the, these bands are completely flat, the spectrum of our new Hamiltonian uh, epsilon tilde is simply plus or minus epsilon naught. So if we square the new Hamiltonian H tilde, we simply get epsilon naught squared times a unit matrix 2n by 2n. Okay, and uh, you can easily check that this implies that uh, this matrix a lowercase q has to be a unitary matrix. Okay, so this matrix is unitary. Namely, q dagger times q has to be equal to q times q dagger has to be equal to unit matrix n by n. OK, so uh, we saw that uh, uh, without losing any of the topological data in our Hamiltonian, we can flatten it and bring it into this uh, form. So now, the, epsilon, the value of epsilon naught doesn't matter. It only determines the spectrum, not uh, the uh, topology. 
So uh, to specify a, uh, a gap system in class BD1, all we need to specify is one unitary matrix Q of K, uh, which is a unitary n by n matrix, which is a function of uh, the one-dimensional quasi-momentum K. Okay, and the question is then, what are the distinct uh, classes of such functions? From uh, the one-dimensional Brillouin zone, which is essentially a circle because uh, the, the uh, uh, quasi-momentum is, is, uh, is, is periodic, uh, 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 from the uh, one-dimensional Brillouin zone into these n by n unitary matrices. Okay, so uh, now we can uh, look up uh, uh, the answer to this classification problem from the, uh, uh, the mathematical literature. And uh, the answer is expressed in this uh, form. Okay, so pi 1 of un is equal to z. What this equation means is basically the classification of maps or the uh, a homotopy group of maps from the one dimensional circle, okay, that's the pi 1, uh, onto the space of n by n unitary matrix, uh, matrices un is uh, classified by an integer invariant z. Okay, and uh, uh, luckily in this particular case, there's actually a very simple uh, expression to compute the uh, explicit invariant uh, um, uh, 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 integer invariant uh, uh, z, which classifies a particular function q of k. Okay, so um, we're given a unitary matrix that depends on quasi-momentum. So it's a periodic function of k. k runs from 0 to 2 pi. And given that uh, unitary matrix, uh, this formula computes for us uh, the uh, integer invariant nu. Okay, so uh, what's the formula? We take the determinant of this uh, unitary matrix. The determinant of a, of a unitary matrix is a complex phase, uni, unimodular uh, uh, number. Okay, we take the logarithm of that, that would give us this, this phase times i. Okay, and we take the derivative of this uh, phase and integrate that over momentum from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, and uh, the, uh, the claim is that uh, the answer of this, uh, um, um, of this uh, formula is always give, uh, it would always give us an integer uh, number. Okay, and that's the uh, integer invariant that we're interested in. Okay, now what is the physical meaning of this integer invariant? Okay, we just uh, presented a way to abstractly compute it given a, given a Hamiltonian after some manipulations. It has a very simple physical significance. This would basically tell us if we have our one dimensional system over here. Okay, and suppose our system is finite, so it has a boundary. The integer invariant tells us about the number of uh, a zero modes, Majorana zero modes, that appear at each one of the two boundaries of this uh, one-dimensional system. Okay, so this general phenomenon is called the bulk edge correspondence. There's a quantity that we can compute in terms of the bulk. This Q of K is a property of the bulk. It knows nothing about the edge. It's actually defined in terms of a uh, system that has periodic boundary conditions. And uh, given the topology of the bulk, meaning the integer invariant classifies the bulk, that tell us, uh, tells us something about the spectrum of a system that has open boundaries, namely that has edges. Now, uh, there's a, a uh, different equivalent write, uh, way to write the uh, integer invariant uh, in this particular case, which is the following. We take our unitary matrix Q of K. We take its derivative, which is a new n by n matrix, multiply that by Q dagger, the uh, a Hermitian conjugate, and take the trace. And then integrate that quantity from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, that gives us the same invariant as we saw before. Okay, this uh, form is slightly uh, a more convenient to generalize later on. Okay, you, why is this uh, a, the invariant? You can easily check, okay, whenever you have a, uh, a matrix formula, it's always convenient to look at the example where uh, the matrix is one by one. Okay, in this particular case, we have, suppose that uh, n is equal to 1, q of k is just e to the i times a phase, theta of k. And then by inserting this into this formula, you can easily check that what this formula gives you 
is simply the number of times this phase changes by 2 pi as k runs from 0 to 2 pi. So it's the number of times this phase winds around the circle uh, uh, as you sweep uh, across the entire Brillouin zone. Okay, so this is the way to express the uh, topological invariant in class D, uh, BD1 in one spatial dimensions. This formula, it turns out, can be generalized to any odd dimension. Okay, so uh, 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 more generally, it turns out that the uh, uh, homotopy group from the d-dimensional sphere, okay, this is the formula for the case d equals 1, but for any d odd, a, a, the pi d or the, the uh, a, a homotopy of maps from the d-dimensional sphere into the space of uh, n by n unitary matrices with n greater than 1 is also equal to z. And for this homotopy group, you can also write a uh, similar looking topological invariant which uh, a generalizes this form. Okay, so now you have uh, a, instead of just one component of uh, a momentum, you have d components, and you have to integrate over all of them. A, okay, there's, this, there's a, 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 a subtlety here. This uh, integral actually runs over a d-dimensional torus, whereas uh, the uh, a classification, as stated here, is actually from a d-dimensional sphere. Okay, so uh, by uh, um, switching from a sphere to a torus, it turns out that we miss some class of topological phases known as weak topological phases, but we won't get into that here. For so, so our purpose, these are essentially the same. Okay, so we integrate over the d-dimensional torus, and uh, um, uh, the form we integrate over is the trace of the product over all the uh, coordinates, the k-coordinates, of this form q dagger dq. Okay, and we multiply all of them together, take the trace, and then combine them to this form. This is the totally anti-symmetric tensor in d dimensions, d being odd. Okay, and there's some normalization factor over here that uh, ensures that the answer is a, uh, a, a, an integer number. So we'll need this uh, generalization later on. But, uh, um, but uh, in one spatial dimension, this is our invariant. OK, so that concludes our um, derivation for class BD1, one spatial dimension. And now we just move on the uh, diagonal. So uh, moving one down, we're now uh, in class D in two spatial dimensions. So what is class D? Class D has no time reversal symmetry. T squared is equal to 0. It has particle hole symmetry that squares to plus 1, c squared equals plus 1, and therefore no sublattice or chiral symmetry. And we're in two spatial dimensions. So what's the classification of such systems? Well, a, a, we have now a two-dimensional um, a, a Hamiltonian, which is a Bogolubov degen Hamiltonian. It has particle hole symmetry. We're dealing with a two-dimensional superconductor with no time reversal symmetry. Uh, so uh, once again, our psi of k is the Nambu spinner, a 2n a dimensional spinner of psi daggers and psi's combined. Okay, and uh, we already saw how to write an invariant that classifies such Hamiltonians. So uh, this is actually nothing but the Chern number that we saw uh, previously for the case of a Chern insulator. Okay, so uh, uh, in fact, we saw that for a case with no particle hole symmetry. Uh, to classify churn insulators, but it turns out that the particle hole is just not playing such an important role in this example. So uh, just to uh, remind you, what's the churn number? So we need to take all the block functions u and k of the uh, negative energy or filled states. Okay, so uh, uh, we take only the negative energy bands and sum over uh, 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 these, uh, uh, these bands. And uh, u and k is simply the block function uh, of the uh, corresponding band at momentum k. OK, and uh, uh, for this, um, um, for this uh, momentum k, we take the Berry curvature, which is given by the uh, imaginary part of this, uh, of this form, okay? which is uh, composed of the x derivative of u and k, a, 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 a inner product with the y derivative of the same u and k. 
Okay, and we need to integrate that over the two-dimensional Brillouin zone, um, and, uh, um, and that gives us the uh, answer, which is an integer invariant, which is nothing but the churn number. Okay, in the case of topological superconductors, this churn number does not have a meaning of a whole connectivity, but it's still a, a topological invariant that we can define. And what's the physical meaning of this uh, invariant? Okay, and a, just like in a churn insulator, in a chiral superconductor, the integer counts how many chiral or a, a co-moving edge states the system would have if we place it a, 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 in a geometry with open boundary conditions. So this is our system. Suppose it's our, our topological superconductor is on this rectangle, and it has some integer invariant nu that uh, the nu tells us how many uh, um, co-propagating edge states we'll get at each one of the edges. Okay, and as before, this topological invariant can be added uh, between different systems. Uh, adding this uh, uh, invariant simply means we stack two systems together. So suppose I have two topological superconductors. Okay, one of them has an invariant new one, and the other one has an invariant new two. If I consider a new system, which is simply the stack of these two uh, uh, topological superconductors together, I'll get a new system that's characterized by an invariant, which is simply the sum of the two invariants. And that simply co uh, corresponds to the fact that my new system would have a number of chiral edge modes, which is just the sum of the chiral edge modes of our, my two systems, one and two. In particular, I have a system which has an invariant of zero. That means that there are no chiral edge states. This is the trivial phase. If I combine one system with nu equals one and another with nu equals minus one, I get the trivial phase and so forth. So this is the group structure of the invariant. Okay, so now we move down to our uh, final example, which is uh, class D3 in three spatial dimensions. Okay, so uh, what is class D3? Class D3 has time reversal symmetry that squares to minus one. So this is gonna be a system of spinful electrons that have time reversal that squares to minus one. It has particle hole symmetry that, all, that squares to plus one. And it has a chiral symmetry, uh, which is the product of the two. Okay, and we're in three spatial dimensions. In this case, we're actually gonna discuss a particular physical system that belongs to this class and it has a non-trivial topology. Okay, and uh, uh, because it is a class that has particle hole symmetry, this is gonna be some kind of superconductor. In fact, our example is not gonna be a, super, a superconductor, but the superfluid. We're gonna discuss a particular phase of superfluid helium-3. So uh, uh, helium-3 atoms are fermions, and uh, uh, they form a Fermi C, and at very low temperature, they actually form a superfluid. And uh, the quasi-particle or fermionic excitations of the superfluid can be classified according to our periodic table. And it turns out that there's one particular phase of the system called the B phase, which uh, forms a non-trivial uh, instance of this uh, classification. And that's what, go what we're going to discuss. Shown here is the phase diagram uh, experimentally determined of, of uh, helium-3. On this axis uh, is uh, a, a, a temperature on a, on a logarithmic scale. And this axis is pressure. And you see that the system has quite a rich phase diagram with several, several different phases. It has a normal liquid phase, it has a solid phase, and several superfluid phases. And we're gonna focus our attention on this particular superfluid phase, the B phase. And it turns out that this uh, superfluid phase it, it, it forms a, a topologically non-trivial example in class D3. So let's uh, uh, discuss the uh, topological classification of phases in class uh, D3 in, th in three spatial dimensions. So as before, we start from the Bogolubov de Gen Hamiltonian. We'll focus on uh, uh, the simplest case, where uh, we have just two electronic states in every momentum, which corresponds to fermions with spin, spin up and spin down. So this is our uh, Nambu spinner, Okay, so it's a four-dimensional spinner, and uh, the psi's are simply psi k up and psi k down. 
Now, we're going to choose a basis in this uh, a slightly peculiar form. OK, so uh, um, in the uh, last two components of the spinner, we're going to write psi of minus k dagger of down and psi a minus k dagger up with a minus sign in front. OK, this is just a choice of basis. Uh, we can always uh, change the basis as, as we want. This just turns out to be a, a particularly convenient choice in class uh, D3. Okay, this will just si simplify our equations. There's another comment that's uh, in order here. Okay, so uh, uh, when we classify solids uh, or superconductors, we uh, think about the uh, uh, three-dimensional momentum as li living in a three-dimensional Brillouin zone which is like a three-dimensional torus because the quasi-momentum is always periodic. But since here we are actually dealing with helium-3, that lives in free space. There's no lattice. It actually lives in a, uh, a, a infinite three-dimensional space of momentum. And we have to be a little bit careful. It turns out not to make a big difference for the classification we'll discuss over here. Okay, uh, 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 so rather than uh, three-dimensional torus, we actually have a three-dimensional infinite space we can, which we can, uh, in fact, think about as a, as a three-sphere or a sphere in a four-dimensional space. The way we do that is we uh, um, uh, identify the point at k uh, goes to infinity with one of the poles of the three-sphere. So we have a, uh, th a, a, uh, a, a three-sphere, a sphere in four spatial dimensions that's, uh, that has three spatial coordinates. One pole is k equals zero the other pole is at k equals infinity. And we'll go into, into that in more detail later on. Okay, but with these details, this is the object we need to classify. This is our h of k. Okay, so uh, uh, as always, in a Bogolub of Degen Hamiltonian, we have a redundancy because we've doubled the number of degrees of freedom. So we can relate psi of k to itself by multiplying by a unitary matrix which is this matrix over here. And uh, um, this matrix interchanges psi's and psi daggers. And then uh, 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 when we, uh, we can correct that by taking k to minus k and taking uh, the Hermitian conjugate of all the elements, with it, which is represented by this operation star. OK, so this is our redundancy of the degrees of freedom. And that identifies for us the particle hole symmetry that the system has in class D3 in our particular choice of basis. So in, our, in the basis we've chosen, particle hole would be represented by this uh, unitary matrix. It's the tensor product of sigma y. Sigma are Pauli matrices that act on the spin degree of freedom, times tau y, which is the Pauli matrix that acts in Nambu space, or on the particle hole degrees of freedom, times complex conjugation. So that's our particle hole. Okay, so uh, in our choice of basis, this is how particle hole is uh, represented. And as usual, uh, conjugating the Hamiltonian h of k by particle hole should give us minus, a, a minus h at minus k. In addition, our system is time reversal symmetric. We're dealing with spinful fermions. So the time reversal operation is, as always, for spinful fermions, it's represented as i sigma y times complex conjugation. This is an operation that flips spin up and spin down, uh, and flips spin down to minus spin up. Okay, it doesn't mix particle, it's particles and holes. Time reversal uh, 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 sends a particle to a particle and a hole to a hole. And on our Hamiltonian h of k, this acts in this way. So uh, um, time reversal uh, operating on h of k gives us h of minus k. And finally, since we have both particle hole and time reversal, we would also have a chiral or sublattice symmetry, which is simply the product. So S, as always, is equal to C times T. So we can multiply, and we find that uh, S is the unitary operator, which is simply I times tau Y. And uh, uh, the sublattice operator anti-commutes with H of K. So conjugating H of K by S should give us H minus H of the same K. So these are the symmetries uh, of uh, class D3. So let's uh, uh, write the most general Hamiltonian for class D3. So first of all, let's use the chiral symmetry. 
Okay, the fact that our Hamiltonian has to obey chiral symmetry means that it has to anti-commute with the chiral operator, which we can choose essentially to be just tau y. So this already tells us that the Hamiltonian can be written in this form. It's a tensor product of some two by two matrix h, uh, lowercase h of, of k times tau z, um, plus another two by two matrix uh, tensor into tau x, and that's it. Okay, we cannot have tau y and we cannot have the unit matrix one in Nambu space. Okay, and uh, um, uh, I've written here explicitly the uh, uh, part that multiplies the tau x. This is the pairing potential. So this part over here is the uh, so-called pairing potential or the uh, anomalous part of the Hamiltonian. And uh, I've written it here explicitly again as a two by two matrix. Okay, and it has two parts, a scalar part, delta k, which is the singlet part. Okay, so this part corresponds to singlet pairing, meaning that it's invariant under spin rotations. And uh, the d of k, which is a vector, and this corresponds to triplet pairing. Okay, so that's a, a, that's a general Hamiltonian in class D3. We also need to require that our Hamiltonian a, is invariant under particle hole. Okay, so uh, a, a, this is the particle hole operation. So we, we conjugate our Hamiltonian by sigma y tau y and take the complex conjugate. And this should give us minus a of minus, a, a, minus h of minus k. And you can easily check that this uh, translates into these three uh, requirements on the two by two matrix H of K, uh, the uh, singlet pairing potential delta K, and the triplet pairing vector uh, pairing potential D of K. Okay, so uh, if we require these three conditions, our Hamiltonian is also invariant under particle hole. And since we've already constructed it to be uh, invariant under chiral or, or a sublattice symmetry, it's guaranteed to also be invariant under time reversal. So that's our most general Hamiltonian, um, uh, uh, which is in class D3. Now we're gonna uh, focus back on the B phase of helium three, and that turns out to have this particular Hamiltonian. Okay, so uh, this is our lower H, uh, lowercase h of k. It's simply a scalar that uh, uh, multiplies tau z, and our pairing potential Okay, is this. So it turns out that in, in helium 3b, uh, it's a triplet superfluid. So delta of k is, uh, is equal to zero, and d of k is this vector, which is uh, v delta times the uh, a momentum k. Okay. So no singlet component, only triplet, and the triplet component is characterized by this uh, a, a, a d vector, which is simply proportional to k. So uh, it's useful to actually draw it. Okay, this is uh, k space. It's three dimensional, but it'll all, only plot k x and k y. Okay, I'm plotting here the Fermi surface. The Fermi surface is the uh, sphere on which a, the h of k is equal to zero. Okay, and we have the d vector dk, which is simply pointing radially out in three in three dimensions. Okay, so uh, that's it. That's the Bogolubov uh, Dejean Hamiltonian of superfluid helium three. And now we need to understand what's the topological classification of, uh, of such Hamiltonians and of this particular Hamiltonian. So first, let's uh, examine the spectrum of this Hamiltonian. So um, uh, we can easily diagonalize this Hamiltonian. Uh, the way it's done is by first squaring the Hamiltonian, diagonalizing h squared. That's particularly easy. Okay, and, uh, um, um, and then taking the uh, square root of the, of the spectrum. And uh, we can easily check that the Hamiltonian, uh, the, the spectrum is given by this formula. 
And importantly for us, okay, so I've drawn the spectrum over here as a function of uh, a, the, um, the magnitude of the momentum. The system is uh, rotationally symmetric, so it's enough to draw the spectrum as a function of the magnitude of a, 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 a momentum. The Fermi level, as always, is at zero energy. And uh, importantly for us, this spectrum does not cross zero energy. So the spectrum of uh, excitations of, uh, of the uh, a, a helium a, a B superfluid phase is actually gapped. OK, so um, now we're going um, um, to bring this Hamiltonian into a more convenient form. This is similar, similar to uh, what we did before. So we're going to apply a, first a unitary transformation that uh, permutes the different Pauli matrices in, a, a, in Nambu space. So uh, this is essentially a rotation in tau space around the 1, 1, 1 direction uh, by 120 degrees. So this uh, a unitary a, a transformation takes tau x to tau y, tau y to tau z, and tau z uh, back into tau x. In this new basis, our uh, Hamiltonian has this form. Okay, it's a combination only of tau x and tau y, no tau z and no uh, unitary uh, matrix in, in Nambu, Nambu space. Okay, which means that uh, we can write the Hamiltonian in this off-diagonal block form with the matrix capital Q of k, where capital Q of k is a two by two matrix, which is given uh, as so. Okay, so it's simply uh, k squared over two m minus mu times a two by two uh, a unitary matrix minus i times the d vector v delta times k, uh, times k, the vector k dotted into the uh, spin Pauli matrices sigma. Okay, so uh, 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 this is our uh, canonical form. Now, uh, just as we did in class BD1 in one spatial dimension, we can flatten the spectrum. Okay, so uh, uh, we can uh, deform the spectrum while not closing the gap. This is guaranteed to leave, leave us in the same topological phase. So we go from H of K into H tilde of K simply by flattening the bands. So our spectrum now of uh, H tilde uh, is simply plus or minus some arbitrary constant epsilon naught. Okay, and uh, uh, we pull this, uh, this epsilon naught in front. The H tilde squares into epsilon naught squared times a four by four unit matrix. And uh, 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 what's left is this, uh, um, is this uh, matrix lowercase q of k, which is written in this form. Okay, and uh, 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 once again, it's easy to check that q, q of k is a unitary matrix. Okay, this follows from this condition. So q dagger q is equal to one, and specifically, uh, q of k has this uh, form. We can uh, any two by two unitary matrix we can write as cosine of some angle theta of k times a two by two uh, a, a unit matrix minus i times sine of theta of k a, a times a unit vector a dotted into sigma. Okay, so k hat is the uh, a normalized a, a momentum k. Okay, k vector over mod k. And uh, a, this uh, angle theta k is given by this expression. Its, it's tangent is the ratio between uh, a v delta a, a mod k and uh, k squared over 2m minus mu. Okay, so uh, a, this is the new form of our Hamiltonian. Okay, and uh, now our Hamiltonian is simply a map from the three-dimensional momentum space into the space of two by two unitary matrices. Okay, and uh, we actually saw that for any odd spatial dimension, we have an, an explicit in, a, a expression for an integer valued invariant for a map from the uh, a, a odd dimensional space onto the space of the unitary matrices of any dimension which is greater than one. Okay, so in, in this particular example, our, uh, the, this, the uh, dimension of our matrix, unitary matrix Q of K is equal to two. 
and uh, we can we can just uh, immediately write what this uh, invariant is. Okay, so it's uh, it's a, it's the trace of uh, this uh, this uh, combination of Q dagger d k q in the three spatial uh, spatial directions, and uh, it, one can prove that uh, uh, generally the result of this computation is an integer number. Okay, so now um, this is very general. What is actually the physical significance of the integer invariant in the case of, uh, of D3? Well, as always, those, uh, there's bulk edge correspondence. So this integer invariant should tell us something about the uh, number and character of uh, a topologically protected edge states that would appear if our system has a boundary. And uh, it turns out that uh, in, in the case of class D3, sp three spatial dimensions, if our, a three-dimensional superfluid helium has a surface, um, um, this uh, surface would contain some number of topologically protected um, um, uh, linearly dispersing edge modes. Okay, so uh, uh, for instance, if nu equals one, there's only a single uh, 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 Dirac, or uh, more precisely, Majorana uh, uh, surface mode that would appear uh, within the gap uh, at that surface. This uh, spectrum is very similar to the spectrum of a 3D topological insulator that you saw before. The difference being is that uh, because this is a superfluid, it has an additional particle hole symmetry. And therefore, um, this uh, uh, Dirac dispersion has to cross, uh, uh, the Dirac point is exactly at zero energy that's protected by particle hole symmetry. Moreover, just like in the topological insulator, the presence of this uh, gapless surface state is protected by time reversal. So if you break time reversal symmetry, for instance, by applying a magnetic field, a, a, this, uh, the, the, uh, a, a, the a surface state would open a gap. Okay, so this is general. Now, what about specifically the Hamiltonian of helium 3b? How do we know that that actually uh, belongs to a non-trivial topological phase? Okay, and moreover, we'd like to uh, uh, get some more feeling, some more intuition to this, uh, to this formula for the invariant. Okay, so let me try to give you a little bit more intuition, in the, specifically in the helium 3b case, to the meaning of the geometric meaning of this invariant. Okay, so here's our uh, flattened Hamiltonian again, H tilde, that has completely flat bands in three spatial dimensions. Now, um, in our example, uh, Q of K is a two by two unitary matrix. We can always bring that matrix by multiplying by a phase. This is like another gate choice. We can bring it into a, a, uh, a matrix in SU2, which means that its determinant is one. Okay, so it's a map from three-dimensional K space into SU2. Now, uh, the space of matrices in SU2 is equivalent to the three-sphere. Okay, this three-sphere is a sphere in four-dimensional space. So it's a, it's a sphere in four spatial dimensions. It's characterized by three coordinates. Uh, so really what we're mapping is a, um, we, we have a map from the three-dimensional momentum space which we argued is itself is equivalent to a three-sphere. It's an infinite dimensional space, with what we can identify the point at infinity with one of the poles and the point at k equals zero with the other pole. So uh, the, uh, the momentum itself, we can think about as living in a three-sphere. And we have a map from the three-sphere of k to the three-sphere of q of k. Okay, now explicitly here is this uh, a, a SU2 matrix Q of K that we've written uh, before, okay, but uh, now we write it in this flattened uh, uh, form. Okay, so uh, we have the amplitude A of K times a two by two unit matrix plus a vector amplitude uh, B of K uh, uh, times minus I times the vector of Pauli matrices in spin space sigma. And uh, um, uh, explicitly, we can write A of K and B of K in this form. Uh, A of K is the cosine of our angle theta K, and B of K is the sine of theta K times the unit vector uh, K. Okay, so uh, 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 the unit vector K hat, which is the, the uh, normalized momentum, and as before, theta of K is given in this uh, explicit form. Okay, so this is our SU2 matrix, and now you can see that each Q of K actually represents a point in S3. This is this, uh, 
this equivalence between uh, SU2 and S3, that's actually explicit here. So how do we see that? Well, a, a, from this uh, form, we can see that AK squared plus a BK dot BK, the norm of the, of the B vector, is equal to 1. So overall, we have here four amplitudes, the, the AK, which is a scalar, and the three components of the vector a, B. And th the square of these four components uh, sum to 1. So this is actually, um, a, each Q of K is actually specifying a single point on S3, on the uh, sphere in four spatial dimensions. OK, and then finally, we, uh, uh, from, uh, from topology, we know that uh, the pi 3 of S3, namely the homotopy of maps from the three sphere back to the three sphere, is equal to z. This is classified by an integer valued invariant. So in this particular case, this would give us the invariant of our system. And the claim is that uh, our particular map, which is uh, characterized by this uh, function q of k, gives us uh, a, an integer invariant, which is plus 1. OK, so what's the meaning of this uh, classification? We're mapping the three sphere to itself. So uh, this uh, um, simply tells us how many times the, ma the mapping uh, wraps around uh, uh, the three sphere. So w w when we go uh, from the target three sphere to the image three sphere, we can count how many uh, times our mapping wraps around. And the claim is that in this particular case, it wraps around only once. Let me try to give you some intuition of this, because this is uh, maybe a little bit abstract. So I cannot draw for you a three-dimensional a, 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 um, a sphere a, in four dimensions. Okay, that's the S3, the three sphere. But I can try to represent it in this way. So uh, let me, uh, highlight, let me uh, highlight one axis of the four directions. So this is this um, a direction AK, and that runs from minus 1 to 1. Okay, so that's the cosine of some angle. It, it, it varies between minus 1 and 1. Minus 1, if you work it out from here, minus 1 corresponds to the origin. Okay, this is K is equal to 0. Plus 1 corresponds to the point at infinity. So this corresponds to k goes to infinity, which is uh, um, the other pole of our three sphere. Okay, and you can check that the matrix Q of k reaches the same uh, value when k goes to infinity, independent of which direction you go. That's actually very important. This is why we can map the three-dimensional k space onto a three sphere. Okay, so now at every value of a k, we have the uh, uh, remaining uh, three coordinates of our three sphere characterized by this vector b of k. So for er every value of a k, we, we can simply draw a regular uh, two sphere, a sphere in three spatial dimensions, the S2, that corresponds to the uh, space of the bk, and that has a radius of the square root of 1 minus a k squared. Okay, so that's how we're going to represent this map. And let's do it, okay? So we can work it out from these formulas. If we go to the, uh, a, a, to the south pole, that's uh, a, this corner over here, a, a k equals minus 1. A, in B space, that's just a point, because the radius of our a, two sphere is 0. So at the, here, we just have a single point at the south pole, a k equals minus 1. Now we go to ak equals 0, which is the equator of our S3. In this point, ak is equal to 0. bk is a, a, the sine of theta, of theta equals pi over 2. That's simply a, uh, a modulus 1 3 sphere. And we see that uh, a, our, our vector b simply covers the entire S2, the entire a, 2 sphere. OK, so uh, this is what our map does. Uh, for a k is equal to 0. And then we go uh, all the way up to the North Pole. And uh, at the North Pole, a k is equal to 1. And therefore, the radius of b k is again 0. OK, so uh, hopefully from this diagram, we can convince ourselves that uh, um, this mapping from the three sphere of k 
to the, to the uh, 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 three sphere of uh, A and B simply covers the sphere once. And this means that our invariant for helium 3B is equal to 1. Just to summarize, in this video, we march along a particular diagonal of the periodic table of topological insulators and superconductors. Uh, uh, these phases are all classified by the mod periodicity, uh, but periodicity, they're all classified by an integer uh, invariant z. And we just worked out explicitly what the form of this integer invariant is and what its physical meaning is. Thank you for watching.